So I'm going to repair this Datron 1062, hopefully. As you can see, I've already started, because I'm doing a live stream right now, and I forgot to start recording. Yeah, well done. So, I've got it running my auto transformer. It did have a blown fuse, which I've replaced. It's currently running 115 volts or so, or 113 going in right now. Just because it's not been converted to 240 volt yet. I will be doing that at some point. And we turn it on. But we don't have a display. So we need to figure out what's causing this to start with. And that's what I'm working on right now. So I've already had a look around the top here, I can't see anything obvious. It was still sealed, it had the calibration sealed on the side from Simco. I've broken those seals to open it up, so the thing was still sealed, which is a good sign. I mean, it's probably had some kind of electronic failure. I've had a look over the top, couldn't see anything obvious on here at least. I'll flip it over, check the bottom side as well. But it's probably a power supply failure, most likely. Those bridge rectifiers are terrible for failing, they're known for it. We have display driver, resistance board, AC board, GPIB board over here. It's still dated 1987, but the GPIB is dated 1986. But it's likely the same firmness. That's 290070A19 on the GPIB. And it's 290005657 and 290113A on the other chip there. So, slightly different versions. It's also interesting that these ones are stacked. They've got stacks on here. These are offset off the board. Now that wasn't so unnoticed before, but obviously it is. Why is that done? Why have they been stacked? It's like the original sockets are here and it's had another socket pot on top of them. Is it because they're using 2732s so or 2532s? Doesn't appear to be, they're going straight through. That's curious, I wonder why they've done that. That's interesting. Maybe those sockets were dodgy at some point and someone replaced them and just put some new sockets on top. Maybe that's what they've done. Because these little plug-in sockets do have issues sometimes, you have to reseat things. So we're close to the bottom, like I was going to do. I've got distracted. So far it all looks fine, I can't see any plugs which have come loose or anything like that. There's a couple of diodes over here, I'll check those as well before I flip it back over. This one does have the rear input option. No ratio, no analog, there's an external trigger. And the current board normally go here, and that's what this jumper here is for, is so the current board. If you have that installed, just make sure it's just in the right place. It is. It basically looks fine, so we need to do some probing around and see what's going on. So let's check these diodes on this side first, and I'll flip it over and check the bridge rectifiers after that. Just want to see what's going on here. Ah. That shows dead short. That was okay. Right, that's fine then. It's probably right. Get the other way around. Dead short again that way. And that way he's looking alright. That's interesting. I might be the transformer one is causing a problem because it's plugged off, off that, maybe that's what's causing it. But in one direction it's working right, it's not dead short both directions, which would be what I'd expect to see if it was failed. I'll flip this over, check the other side out. That's okay. That one's okay. I thought it's been alright. No, I don't. That'd be why. Let's do it any other way. Should be open. Yep. That way, it should be open. Yep. This way should be diode bridge or diode drop. It is, and this way should be diode drop. It is. Same for the other one. Charge up capacitor, that's fine. Likewise, there. Charging up cap. Around. I'm actually surprised these aren't blown. Which actually makes me a bit more concerned. Because I thought it'd be one of these. Alright. Well, I guess I'll have to check some voltages around. I might have to put up the circuit diagrams and everything. A bit more work. So I'm going to test voltages on the supply that goes to the display, just to rule out that supply is actually working okay, or prove that display is working okay. So I need to figure out why the display doesn't work. Because obviously it's either no power to the display system, a high voltage supply because it's like a um, VFD display, or it's the display driver system, which is wrong, it's not actually turning the display on. I can measure over here, and I should be getting 180 volts between these two test points, which is TP1, TP2. Let's measure these voltages on here. So that has got power going to the unit. 
I'm going to stick the probes on and then I'm going to turn it on. That way I don't risk slipping with the power on. Show those in there. 180 volts. That's working fine. That rolls that out. Okay, this gets a bit more interesting. So I was checking this stuff with a the thermal camera and there's a couple of diodes over here which I checked before with the meter and they're actually pretty hot, about 66 degrees. So uh, you can see on the back of the board there if I get the angle right. That area is pretty warm. Let's check the main boards as well. It's looking kind of alright. I'm seeing some hot spots, you can actually see the, the warmth in the chips. I get it right. 54 degrees in this area here. So there's a few little hot spots around the place, which is showing up quite a lot. But uh, power supply is one concern right now, so I'm 60 degrees there. So I'll shut this back off again. Nothing's going completely off the charts, but uh, there's a few things to investigate, especially over here. Uh, that's right, I was going to check three and four. That's right. Turn it back on again. It's been three and four. Five volts. There we go, five point one. That's what it's supposed to be. Okay, let's flip this over. Check the 15 volt rails, which I can find over here. So the common was over here somewhere. I think it was that one. Yeah. This one for 15. Where's the other one? There it is. That's here as well. So about 15 volt rails are there. Okay, so the power supply rails are there. But we've got no display and we've got the hotspot on the display board. So we'll look there. So it's gone around and reseated a whole bunch of connectors of the relevant sections. I haven't done all of them. Just to rule that out, we'll see if that does anything. If not, we'll try and measure some voltages down here and see if they're trying to drive voltages to the VFD or not. I'm hoping the problem's on this board. Yeah, still no display. So that didn't solve it by reseating. So let's keep looking. So I'll just take the front panel off and just check the VFD. And we'll see if the VFD's got any physical damage to it. Just in case that's what's wrong. In case I'm trying to diagnose a literal problem and actually there is a physical problem after all. So this is a nice simple check. See if there's a crack across the front of this VFD or something. You never know. The back of it looks okay because it's got like a little nipple on the back which is used for sealing it when they do the gassing. That looks okay. Check the VFD itself out physically in the front panel. Oh yes, that's what's wrong. Damn it. VFD is cracked. Big crack right from the middle of it. That's how I should have started, shouldn't I? Eh? Damn. So I'm looking at reverse engineering this now and just trying to figure out what I can do for the display. So what I'm looking at doing now is using individual seven segment displays, making a circuit board up for that and replacing this whole thing with a seven segment display array using a low voltage drive. So I'm just checking around and finding out what we've got going on here. So relative to chassis ground, we've got the junction of the Zener diode and that R41. We're getting minus 70 volts there. So that is one of the supply rails which goes via, via the various switching transistors over here to drive each digit. So that's a digit drive it's, and also a segment drive as well. So it's referenced to minus 70 volts on one side. So I'm busy 3D printing. Here's a frame which is going to be used for around the enunciators. Here's a second frame, which is for the sign enunciator. Not as well printed, but it doesn't matter. Shouldn't see it behind the screen anyway. Here is the positive, negative enunciator. And here are the other ones. So as you can see, I've printed these out of transparent PLA. Um, and there's the symbol here. It's printed pretty well. This is printed using a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. And like, there's my finger for scale. It's all pretty small stuff. I've actually laid this out as it will appear in the frame. So basically I've got the fr I built the frame first and then I used that as a former to figure out this layout. Now it's not exactly perfect. I did increase the gaps slightly on the actual translucent sections to try and create gaps that I will drop in but um, they're actually a little bit tighter than I actually want so it's not perfect in that way yet. My plan is to make all these fit inside this frame and then get them all flush with the front face most likely and then well, I've, got, I've got some black paint, I've got some acrylic paint I'm going to paint around the edges so all these are raised that's why I did those raised edges with a large flat step so I can paint around them 
that should then highlight the actual text itself. Hopefully it'll work. The main one I'm worried about is this remote one. This is really small. It's not an easy one to actually capture. I mean, it's, that's really, that one's not good. The printing on this is pretty tiny. The PPM's kind of okay. Cal's all right. And the percentage has come up fairly well as well. So I'm not too worried about the other ones. This is the one I'm worried about, but remote is not something I tend to use anyway. So I'm probably never gonna see it, come on. But I should still try and get it as good as I can. But that's the plan. So paint around the outsides and like in this symbol here, because I've used the bar of the negative to form the positive as well. So I've only actually added two more LEDs to create a positive. The yeah, it sort of steps in series. In theory, I haven't tried it yet, it should actually work. So on negative it's doing just the two diodes to form the bar two dials into end and then in positive I've got a, some transistors which are switching the voltages and they actually put a higher voltage across all four so these actually two these two here are actually in series with these the other two so all I'll do is I put a positive a higher voltage onto the other two which are in series and that should light up all four of about the same brightness in theory that's the plan but I've got a little notch inside here between the bars I'm gonna try and get paint down inside that notch so you don't get any bleed through and that sort of stuff. So it's going to be a bit fiddly, but uh, it might work. But I'm quite surprised. Actually, I'm quite pleased with the print. The actual print quality this has come out really well. I'm very happy with that. You know, 0.2mm nozzle. I've never used a 0.2mm nozzle before. It's the smallest I've ever done. I purchased it thinking I'd use it for fine stuff, and yep, sure enough, I have. This is pretty fine. It's come out really nice. The only problem I have is the nozzle clogging. It, it worked fine when I did the print, but when I went to go and reprint these ones, it wouldn't come out, nothing came out, nothing came out, the nozzle was clogged. So I had to take it off, I'll just swap the nozzle out, put another one on. For the sake of doing this, I mean, they're cheap enough. I could almost make them disposable, couldn't you? That's that. So I'll just uh, change this over to 240 volts. I've still got the flux here, I've got uncleaned it up yet. There's two links here, one, normally when 110 volts, they're vertical links. And you take the bottom, we take one of them out, and then you take one of them and spin it around. So it's linked across the top instead. Pretty simple modification. So I'm doing a conversion for the display on this, so now I've done the 240 volt conversion on here, so I don't have to worry about accidentally blowing it up by having 240 volts coming in on a 110 volt setting. What I've got to do, I've got to remove this link over here, I've got to do some modifications on the driver board over here. Now taking this link away, that takes away the 175 volts, or negative 175 volt rail, which feeds this board over here, which then goes back out again to the display. By taking it out means this board is then safe, there's no 175 volts along here, it makes the whole thing a lot safer to work on and touching and probing around and stuff like that. So I'll pull that link out, that takes that away. We also need to change some resistors on here and also bridge some other ones out and change this link over here as well. There's a link right there, which is the, normally the 175 volts goes through that link. But if you take that link out and spin it around and go to a zero volt rail, then that'll make that rail go zero volts when those signals turn on. So it'll be pulling between five volts and zero volts through the resistors. Then we'll do that, that's that basically modified then and then we'll go through, swap out the broken display with the one I've just built, which is just here, which is prototype, it may or may not end well. These I'm not completely happy with, I mean, they work. It's not pretty. <laughs> I might change that to an OLED. I'm actually thinking I could put an OLED display in this space and have a dual function, so I've got this section normally, and then have a Arduino Pro Mini is what I was planning on using, driving a small OLED display which could sit next to it instead to drive the lunch loaders. That's a, my fallback plan. I'm hoping this will be good enough. If it's not, then that's the fallback. So, in the time being, just do this links. So let's just pull this one up, and that should be all we need to do. Let's try and get them off to do this left handed. One side. No, I can do it right handed. There you go, that's a link out. So eventually as well what I'll do is I'll change the power supply section. If this all works properly and I don't have to worry about that minus 175 rail anymore, I'll actually dismantle this section of the power supply and keep that. I'll basically just use that as parts because it works. There's, there's minus 175 volts around the place. So if it's no longer needed in here, I'll, I'll strip that part out and use it as a spares, as a spares packet, I suppose, for a future repair potential. You know, if I get one of these which has got a blown power supply, I could at least then have parts to do that. So that's those two parts done. Now you've got to get this board out. 